I was asked to speak about what to do. I don't know why I particularly was asked that question, what to do about this. I usually don't have any terrific ideas about what to do about anything. Um, but I thought about it and I came up with seven options. And I'm going to list them in sort of ascending order of effectiveness if they could be pulled off. And I, I, I mean effectiveness in the sense of would this work if we could do it, not how realistic is it that we can do it. Um, so one, infiltrate these companies. Two, apply shareholder pressure. Three, boycott them. Four, use state power against them. Five, build parallel institutions. Six, wait for the salt to collapse. Seven, accelerate the collapse. <laughs> okay? So let's, let's go through them. Um, I'll try to, yeah. Infiltrate them. All right. Um, meaning, like, tell, I'm a college professor, so I, I have students come to me all the time and say, oh, you did X or you did Y in your career. I'd like to do that too. How do I get into that? And I, you know, I'm honest with them. I tell them how I, how I did it. But I also try to tell them, look, there are, there are costs to this. And it's a, it could be a problem for you. And you need to think about it before you decide to pursue this particular career. Um, this would be in, essentially an attempt by the right to do what the left, the so-called long march through the institutions. Are we capable of doing that, of recruiting all of these people and, and doing what to these institutions what the left did to them over the last 50 years? I have my doubts as to whether we have the organizational capacity and so on and so forth. I also, we also, before we would encourage, before I would encourage any student of mine who says, I want to go to New York and join, you know, some big corporation, um, I have to, I, I'm honest with them and tell them what they're up against. And if you send them into one of these institutions, you know, they're not going to be joining a, a big company in 2005 like I did for the first time. They're going to be joining it in 2021 and they're going to have a very different experience. And to be a dissident within that company is going to be hard for a lot of the reasons that Chris said. You can either, you can try to shake things up, uh, in which case you're going to be putting your career at risk, or you can just sort of keep your head down and be quiet and do your job and make money, in which case you're not really performing a long march to the institutions, you're just burrowing in. And I don't know how effective ultimately that would be. Um, shareholder pressure. I know I, I, I never, uh, we had a speaker ask a question about this and Andy talked about it too. This is effective, I agree it's effective, but again, what we can do seems to me to be pale in comparison to what the left does in two senses. One, I, you know, I, I remember the very first time I went to an annual meeting. I'd never been to one before. And um, it was in Manhattan in 2005, um, in my first job out of government. Um, and I, you know, oh, the annual meeting, you should come and watch this. I thought, oh, sure. And I just, and uh, it, was, it was News Corp for what it's worth, the pre Division News Corp, which is now two companies, News Corp owns the sort of the newspapers and 20th, 21st Century Fox owns the TV properties, but back then they were one company. And Rupert Murdoch was and is the chairman and he just had to sit there and listen to people come up to the microphone and harangue him in really ungodly bad terms. And I thought, I was just shocked by this. I was like, I can't believe this is happening. And I, I like, went out to the lobby at one break and I called my father, who's been a corporate lawyer for years. I, said, I can't believe what I'm seeing. So, well, I could explain it to him. He goes, that's what they do. I mean, they let off steam. This is just theater. You, you, you're, you're, you're like the young horse who hears a car backfire and freaks out. And you look around, all the other horses are still chewing grass. You need to hear it a couple of times and you realize this is, this is just sound and fury. Except that it isn't really. The, these activists can apply and can and do apply pressure that shareholders listen to because they want it more. They want it more than we, than our side. And this is, tip, this is a problem conservatives have across the board is... You know, there's always the, a little share of the population for whatever that cares deeply about some issue that will make noise and cause trouble and, and, until they get their way. And our side tends to want to go about their business and do their jobs and live their lives. And we, they, we don't want it as much. And so we let them have their way. And the other problem on the shareholder pressure is Andy talked about. I was at my last job, I assume for the rest of my life in corporate America, was at BlackRock, of all things, um, which is, as Andy said, the number one, two, or three shareholder in most companies. It's a humongous firm and with enormous outsized power. When I left five years ago, was it five? I guess it was four. Um, at BlackRock was $4.7 trillion under management, AUM. It's nine today. In four years, it's almost doubled its AUM, right? Its power just keeps getting more and more immense. BlackRock famously for the longest time didn't used to vote its shares, right? And they turned on a dime at a certain, I don't know exactly when, but they turned on a dime and said, no, we're not only are we going to vote our shares, we're going to vote them only in the, the terms that have been described here. Like BlackRock never takes a stand for anything conservatives care about, ever. They often take stands for things conservatives oppose. How, I, I'm all for applying shareholder pressure wherever possible, but we have to keep in mind that 
the, the other side's ability to apply it, both through these institutional investors and through the activists who simply care more, is greater, I think, than ours. Um, the, the third is boycott them. Um, as Rad said earlier, conservatives don't boycott. In general, I think he's right. I mean, it's, it's first of all, because we don't care as much. The left cares more. So, you know, if you, you know, uh, want to, it's hard to boycott. You've got to keep a list of all the things that you won't buy. You gotta, I, mean, I have friends of mine going back years to say, I'm not going to buy anything made in China. First of all, try finding something that isn't made in China. Okay, but let's say you can. You can keep extensive lists. You're going to have to look, look at the packaging on every decision you make. And who, who's going to, you know, how do you, some people who really, really care are going to um, uh, go to that length, that effort. But very few, I think, are. It's hard. I don't, I don't see us mass mobilizing our side to do that. Now, there are uh, these re recent exceptions. Uh, you know, I, I know a lot of people were um, ticked off at Coke. You know, I, I remember, you know, I, I read emails from people, I'm never drinking another one of their products again. And it was enough, I guess, to at least scare Coke or hurt them temporarily. I don't know how long that's going to keep up and that's going to last. But um, I, I would say, though, if we could do this, if we could actually organize this to say, you do this, we'll boycott or we'll, you know, it would work. It would definitely work. And maybe Azarad's, po Azarad's point, you know, conservatives don't boycott, maybe that's true up until the point that it isn't. Maybe people will start to get fed up enough that they'll say, you know, I mean, look, I, I grew up in California. I, I've, been go, I've been going to Disneyland since I was a little kid. I took my daughter there, um, I don't know, five, six years ago. And my son's never been. And at this point, I don't think I would ever go. I'm just, you know, I, first of all, I don't know that he cares that much. If you kind of grow up on the product, maybe you do. But like, you know, is, that's a personal decision that I made. Is that gonna be enough to mobilize conservatives more broadly? I think it could be if we put some more energy into this. Um, the fourth. Use state power against these companies. Now, this is, a this is a particular problem for conservatives because of their ideology. They will say, and they often do say, um, um, you know, these are private companies, they can do what they want, sort of. Um, um, we can't interfere in the judgment of the market, and so on and so forth. Well, it, it was a Republican, albeit a progressive Republican, that the Claremont Institute has mixed feelings about, I will say, named Teddy Roosevelt, uh, who used state power to bust trusts that had accumulated too much authority over the economy and society at the turn of the, the prior century. Republicans have been completely allergic to using state power in this way, even against companies that uh, companies and industries that are absolutely there, sorry, I can't think of a better term for it, not one that is in any event more accurate, they're enemies, right? They won't, and they, and they won't do things that are in the public interest against companies that are their personal and political enemies and that act against the public interest because of this ideology. So overcoming that ideology is going to be hard, but I think that's something that, uh, you know, to borrow from Chris here, we can win the debate on that. I don't know if we can win the fight. I mean, because I think the arguments that, the, that the, the so called conservatives have on this is actually quite stupid. The debate is fairly easy to win. Getting the actual people elected who are willing to use state power is harder. I, I've heard, you know, we heard, we hear promising noises sometimes from the Senate, from Hawley, from some others. Uh, most of what they propose actually looks like fairly weak tea. Now that could be just the beginning, and the further along we get into this process, the worse it gets, the more they're going to propose very serious things. But usually when you get a bunch of conservatives together and say, well, we're going to, we're going to go after big tech, or we're going to do X, or we're going to do Y, and you look at the, you look at the actual text of the bill, it's, 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 it's quite weak. Um, the fifth was build parallel institutions. Now this is of course borrowing from the, 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 which has become now just a joke phrase, you know, well, build your own Google, build your own bank, build your own country or society and so on. It's become, the, the libertarians, it's, it's been you know, used to say that, I think, in, well, they still say it in earnest, but now you one hears it more as a taunt back at them at the stupidity and shallowness of their arguments. Um, that sounds very hard to do and it would be very hard to do. On the other hand, as a, uh, as a believer that um, often good things arise from necessity, I think as, as, if, if and as capital and these big companies become more and more woke, this is going to become a necessity. Well, the more people get unbanked, somebody's going to come along and say, I'm going to build a bank that's going to allow you to put your money in and I'm not going to go scour your Twitter to see if you've said a bad word before and so on. I think this could happen. Now, then, then what will happen, of course, is the... the the regime, which is a combination of the government and, and these woke capital institutions, will find a way to lock these parallel institutions out of the systems to make them unviable, which means that they're going to have to turn the screws of their tyranny 
to a much greater degree than they've done so far. We'll see if they're willing to do that, and we'll see how effective they can be at that. But conservatives are going to have to be willing to build these parallel institutions if we're going to um, solve this problem eventually. And I think, I think necessity you know, it will spur that. That is to say, we all recognize right now it would be useful if we had you know, banks that didn't exclude people over this and, 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 and so on. If we had um, search engines that didn't tweak the algorithms to suppress certain information and promote other information, if we had all of these. But we're not gonna really start taking them seriously or building them until we feel the real pinch of necessity. And unfortunately, I think at this point, we don't feel it keenly enough. But I think the day is coming probably when we will or when we might. Um, sixth is wait for this all to collapse and go away. Um, I am a believer that it will have to. That is to say, um, this one I maybe can talk about a little bit longer because um, having worked in a lot of these companies and then been for a number of years a consultant to many more, I know them pretty well from the inside, got to know, understand the mindset. Um, they're willing to sacrifice a certain amount of profit and a certain amount of competence for a certain amount of time to virtue signal. So, you, they, they kind of go through their argument in stages. One is, this doesn't cost us anything. Doing all this stuff actually makes us money. We do better when we adopt woke policies, when we hire on, on, on a basis other than, you know, strictly merit or the best person for the job and so on. And they, they come up with all of these rational, uh, rationalizations, arguments for it. Um, la 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 layer two is sort of, well, we might lose a little bit at the margins, but it's, um, uh, it's, it's more than compensated for by all the things that we, we gain. Um, level three is, I'm willing to pay a price for doing the right thing. I mean, we heard a couple of quotes along those lines. I think Peterson quoted, you know, Phil Knight saying that. And, you know, I mean, the woke CEOs are not new. Uh, I would say, though, for one thing, F Phil Knight, just as a, not that I've ever done any work for them, uh, but uh, he's a little bit of an outlier in that, he, you know, he's a, he's a real 60s guy who went in with that, the idea of, making this company as kind of flower childy as he could, sort of like Howard Schultz at Starbucks. So I don't know that, I don't know that he's, he's quite as represented. He's more vanguard. Um, but they all eventually get to the point where, well, I'm willing to pay a price for doing the right thing. But Andy is certainly right that the purpose of these companies is profit. And we will see, we will test the economic laws of gravity if they can continue paying these prices forever and not see profitability go down, efficiency go down, eventually the stock price go down, and, and eventually these places just stop functioning the way they're supposed to, and the shareholders bail. We're certainly not at that point right now. Um, I just checked on my phone to see what, you know, when I left um, BLK, uh, the stock was in the 400s. Um, it got under the Trump rally in 20, uh, the first year of the Trump administration, it got all the way to about 590, and then it went, back down and it was in the kind of in the four, three to four hundreds again. Well, it's been doing great lately. It's at 850 right now. So m these places are not, they're not suffering yet from any of these decisions, but if economics works the way, you know, the old textbooks, the ones that told the truth about supply and demand and things like that, works the way we think it does, they'll eventually pay a price for this and the system will break. You can't keep making decisions that don't have to do with your core, that, that, that either have nothing to do with your core business or that are antithetical to the interests of your core business and keep expecting profitability to go up and the stock price to go up forever. But, okay, segue to number seven, which is wait for the collapse. Or no, so that, sorry, six was wait for the collapse, seven was accelerate it. Well, why wait? Um, why not, you know, why not see if we can turn the screws on them a little and speed this process up? Say, wait a minute, you said you, your board has to be only 5%, um, you know, hires based on criteria other than, well, why not make it 100%? You know, why, not, why, why shouldn't the conservatives kind of start just concern trolling the heck out of woke capital and saying, you are not living up to your stated principles. If you are living up to your stated principles, here are the, here's the list of things you would have been doing and just, we put our own pressure on them and say, you gotta adopt all of these policies in order to be, in order to have a clear conscience and to be standing up for what is right. And yeah, you know, of course, m most if not all of these policies would lead to their imminent collapse. Um, are they going to listen to us on something like that? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Um, I, I will. I, I think though that 
it, it, I, don't, I don't know if it would be more effective, but it might be, it might be somewhat effective. As, as Chris says, calling out hypocrisy doesn't, never, never works. They, they, a, they don't care. B, hypocrisy is priced in. And C, hypocrisy is, actually becomes part of a point of pride at a certain point um, in the way these companies op operate. But telling them, you know, uh, if, you, if you say you stand for X, but you're doing Y and Z, that's wrong. You need to, you need to go all the way. Um, uh, that does have some. That does have something of an effect on them. Um, so now, uh, all of that I think, as I said, an ascending order of effectiveness in the sense of would it work or could we pull it off? Not not in the sense of could we pull it off. Um, in that latter sense, I do think things are going to have to get significantly worse before they get better. And I'm going to. I don't know how many. So several of you were here at a conference. Not here, but we did it in Vegas, but at a Claremont Institute conference that we did earlier in July, or in, in January, about big tech. So it was kind of a subset of this problem. One industry in woke capital, but a very powerful one. And uh, Curtis Yarvin was there, and he said something that stuck with me, I thought was memorable and wise. He says, you know, well, what, what do we do about Twitter and Google in particular? And he said, well, people were proposing various ways to pressure them. So think about it this way: If you're Jack Dorsey, what do you? Who are who are the who are the the priests that you care about the most? The people whose opinions matter to you most? And it's basically Harvard and the New York Times. He really cares of what's said about him in the New York Times. He cares what the Harvard faculty and the lead intellectuals think. He doesn't necessarily care what conservative activists think. Um, is it possible for us as a group to put more pressure on Jack Dorsey than Harvard and the New York Times? puts on Jack Dorsey. So he's pressed from both directions, right? But on the one hand, it's a boulder that will run him over and squash him like a bug. And then on the other hand, it's a, you know, it's a 98 pound guy kind of going like this. So he's pressed. As, as, a, as a college professor, I remember this very vividly. I was talking about, I was in an astronomy class, I was talking about gravity. And uh, it's all bodies, you know, right? gravity is a mutual attraction between all bodies. And so to expl somebody asked him the question, it was a huge lecture hall, somebody asked him the question, well, what does that mean, you know, I know that if I jump off Sather Tower, which is a tower in the middle of the Berkeley campus, I will fall, um, does that mean the earth is, he said, oh yes, absolutely, if you jump off the Campanile right now, the earth will rise to meet you, but it will, it will be by like some, you know, a micron or so, and the, most of it will be you going to meet the earth, and you will, you will of course be killed since the thing is 300 feet tall. It's the same sort of pressure that's on Jack Dorsey. We can apply some pressure, but we can't come even close to the amount of pressure that the parallel institutions apply. And that's, to me, the fundamental problem. Until and unless people feel either, uh, probably some combination of outrage, exhaustion, and necessity that they can't tolerate this anymore. And they re then they'll really start putting the pressure on these companies. Until then, knowing these places from the inside, I don't expect them to change. Right now, they don't, f they don't fear us much at all, at all. I think Chris probably thinks that they do because he's put a ton of pressure on them. I mean, he's maybe the counter example to what I'm saying is he's put a ton of pressure on them and gotten them to, but it's, to me, it's still kind of in the early game, but that's what we would need to do to actually fix these problems or address these problems in any event.